Hello to everybody, dear friends. Um, we are here to talk about art and democracy, very simple items. Um, with uh, Sharon Ament, uh, the director of the Museum uh, of the Museum of London, of the City of London, uh, Andreas Angelidakis, the very well-known Greek artist, uh, and Tadeusz Ropak, uh, the founder of. Uh, the galleries with the same name uh, in Paris, Salzburg, Seoul, and London. Uh, so the first uh, question uh, about art and democracy, I would like to uh, uh, address it to uh, Tadeus. Uh, Tadeus, uh, uh, how does democracy uh, uh, can be mixed with art at the last maybe uh, 40 or 50 years? Is art uh, different than before in this domain? Um, yes, I always say that you know, in the last 40 years since I'm active in the art world, um, I've seen how things have moved from the ivory tower into the center of life. Um, I was fortunate to work as an intern with the German artist Joseph Beuys in 1982. It was actually documentary year 1982. And Boyce was somebody who was very much, you know, um, trying to open up the art world. The art world was actually a very um, exclusive, you know, intellectually exclusive club, and it was not easy to get access to it, and it was not very exposed. It was not very much in the world, and even so, with all these thought-provoking ideas, um, it hasn't really arrived to be politically active or fighting for democracy or rights or... You know, and when I think, you know, Boyce was the one who said everybody's an artist and he kind of was provoking it. He tried to break this um, exclusivity and, and make it more inclusive. And when I think it took another 30 years that, you know, women have really arrived as big participants in this world or another almost 40 years that, that we have, um, you know, African-American, you know, as a strong part of the art world. Um, I think the art world is less political as we sometimes wish it would be, and and but this is changing. I think you know we are maybe living in the most exciting times of the art world, who really is part of life, is part of politics, is part of uh, trying to change society and and discuss democracy and everything which it implies. Um, but I think there's still a long way to go. But I think you know it took a very long time and. This is surprising. But uh, do you think, Andreas, you as an artist, uh, uh, do you think that everybody can be an artist? Um, I guess not, you know, to be honest. But, but you know, that, it wasn't me that said that, so that was uh, Joseph Boys. And I think he, his saying was kind of conceptual as well. We should not take it uh, too as face value. Um, but I, I agree with Tadeus that it's, it's an interesting moment, especially because the younger generations are much more engaged, I feel, uh, with civic rights, with, with equality, with gender rights. So it's a kind of interesting moment for society as well, and that reflects onto art. My uh, question is more... Um, uh, the fact that art has become less elitistic, does it mean that it's more democratic? I don't know that it has become... Yes, it's less elitistic, but it's still a kind of uh, section of the world. Um, I guess the distribution of art can be democratic, but the production of art is usually... a. Uh, uh, at least for me, a very solitary process. Um, but yes, when you, when you present your art or what you decide to present, uh, that I think has, yes, it's definitely working with democracy. Sharon, you as uh, the director of the Museum of the City of London, how do you see the evolution of art these last decades? Um, I think we'd all be, I mean, what we've heard today and, and we will be um, almost um, unconscious if we did not recognise we're in a particular moment. 
um, where the world is fragile and where democracy feels fragile. Um, and it feels, whether it's artists or museums or institutions like libraries and archives, as we, as, as we just heard, um, you know, the trust of the pub in public institutions is really important and plays such an important part in our democracy. So, um, I've forgotten what your question was, but I'm going to carry on anyway saying what I'm saying, which is that museums are really important, galleries are really important, the public investment um, and philanthropic support for art in all its breadth, from the institutions that show it to the artists that make it to the streets we live in, which uh, has the capacity to show art, is part of this kind of democratic ecosystem. And I think what we've learned from the pandemic is that a really strong, the society needs a really strong public sector to enable capitalism to flourish. And uh, the museum, uh, as uh, it's a building that hosts art, but it's a work of art itself as, uh, as architecture, isn't it so? It participates in the city, in the life of the city. So in the demos, vimos, the public domain, the I res guess. publica. Yeah, ab absolutely. And we were just talking over lunch about how museums themselves become places of protest. They become places where, you know, that, that have art, art holdings. They become, they make art. In the case of my museum, we take protest um, democratic protest. Um, uh, there's one example I was talking about over lunch. You know, Brian Hawes, a protester who camped outside of the Houses of Parliament in the UK for many years, and his whole life was in a tent. This protest, his single life was a protest, and it's now in our museum, and now it's art. So it can can work in reverse as well. So museums and art galleries. There's public spaces for art, are places of that kind of, they're a democratic, part of the democratic kind of crucible, um, which I think is, of course, extremely important. I would like to read you something that uh, Renzo Piano told me in Paris about public buildings. Uh, he said me, uh, to me, uh, public buildings or private buildings that become institutions like New York Times in New York uh, are spaces where the ritual of the city takes place. They keep barbarity away from the city. They are spaces where people meet, spaces where, at a certain degree, differences disappear, people's experiences mix together. It's somehow like a little bit like a city with its streets and its squares, those spaces where the miracle of tolerance takes place, the miracle of being together in diversity. A building is not only a building, it's a piece of the city. It's an open element that is in dialogue with the city. Andreas Angelidakis, uh, what's your opinion about that? Um, because our architecture is very present in your work. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned demos, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, because I actually made the, my, one of my most famous works is called demos. Um, what I usually make is these seating systems for museums that can be used for public programs or conversations. And when um, Documenta 14 asked me to make um, the space for their public programs, which was the Parliament of Bodies by Paul Preciado. Uh, I, I, I came up with this system of, of blocks that were meant to echo the actual steps uh, on the Hill of Pnika where democracy kind of was invented. Mm -hmm. um, which for me was, it was not a political act, but I know that the, the, the piece itself generates politics because it's a kind of work that people can rearrange as they want, and they can even play with it. And that's not the, the typical uh, behavior you expect from a museum goer. So I think, yes, what Renzo Piano says is true, but I mean, there's other tools to push this much more than just making a, a beautiful building. Thinking of how uh, behaviorally, you're going to challenge the visitor and, and how, what you're going to get them to do. 
could be much more, yeah. That, that could be a recipe, I think. Tadeus is a gallery, a place like that, that as we described before? Mm, yes, I would say so, but a gallery on one side, of course, it's a commercial place. You know, it tries to place the works an artist is doing in his studio. Um, but also galleries are trying to work with artists on many projects, you know. And I think what the experience of the last few years, and I think this is quite exciting, is that artists, you know, what, with their projects, but also galleries helping them in their projects, going outside this, this space, because the space itself, you know, keeps it um, in a certain um, still elitism, you know, many people have a problem to walk into a gallery or to walk into a museum. It's maybe easier with the museum because they know they pay an entry fee and they have the right to be there. Um, and we are trying to break these borders. And, and I think the last few years have shown us that art wants to go outside of these clubs, outside of these buildings. And, and uh, you know, at this very day, Documenta is opened in Kassel. And we know that the concept, and I'm very much looking forward to go there, is to go outside and to go really in the middle of society and break these borders, break this, this, um, the space itself and reach people on a, diff on a different level. And I think, um, um, I think we are succeeding in, in this urge of doing this. And, and also, as a gallery, you know, the artists want it. You know, they don't want anymore this exclusive club. They want to reach people on a different level and to have a direct contact to an audience and not only to, to collectors or critics or curators who are still part of an of a inner circle. Uh, Sharon, uh, in the Museum of London, what kind of, uh, of art can we see of different forms of art? We have um, a reasonable art collection. We're always commissioning art, and that's really important um, for um, the vibrancy of our relationship with artists and creative producers in London. Um, the, um, you, know, uh, you know, we've got the usual wonderful photographic collections, amazing um, visual art, um, uh, but we're really interested in that which connects to the city, of course. Um, and London, as a city, is, um, has been affected by the world and affects the world. It's a global city, so we stretch the bounds beyond the locale of London itself. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the spilling out and the coming into buildings that are called museums. Um, and the breaking down of barriers. So the, so the, the quote I thought was, extra, was exquisite mm -hmm. in the kind of understanding of the role of a museum. Um, and we're moving to, uh, a, we're repurposing uh, in a very environmentally sustainable way an old market building. And what I have found is that the, um, the the very uh, nature of a market, which is this flowing of people in and out for a transaction, um, a market building is the best model for a museum that there could possibly be. And I didn't kind of understand that before. It's got nine entrances. It's kind of off a human scale. It's not trying to be bombastically, you know, academic or neoclassical or anything. It's just a very democratic space. Um, and that kind of realisation has made me think hard about the kinds of architectural responses to museums and galleries. And the previous uh, conversation this morning around, you know, is the star architect dead uh, in relation to building of museums, even though lots of architects seem to want them in their portfolios, very compelling. Um, you know, kind of I'm, I'm thinking hard about that now. So there is a dialogue between the, the works of art and, and the audience. Um, and, but this is something new, I think, the, the, the last decades, because before, when uh, work of arts were more academic, uh, the audience were, was more passive than now, nowadays. Now the audience is more participating, and there is an interaction, there is a dialogue between uh, the work of art and uh, uh, and the audience, uh, isn't it so, Andreas? Are you? Um, don't you don't you feel this interaction between your works 
and the, the audience that comes to visit your work, to see your work? Um, I would say that in the, um, the past, works were less academic, you know, because when you were going to admire a painting, you knew what the mechanics of the work were, what you were supposed to be looking mm -hmm. at. Whereas today, if you go to a museum, sometimes you don't know exactly what you should be looking at. But of course, the world is like internet now, so every, everybody kind of knows more things. Uh, but I wanted more to, to talk about what you said about b buildings before. Um, and it's, of course, buildings and museums as well are symbols, and not always positive ones. For example, I'm, I'm uh, now working, I'm, I'm obsessed with archaeology and ruins since forever. And uh, I'm just working on a commission by Audemars Piguet um, and Denis Pernet, which is going to be an exhibition in Paris. But the subject is, uh, or the initial starting subject, is the Temple of Zeus in Athens, which is now called the Columns of Zeus, because so little of it um, remains. And I was fascinated to find out that when this was a, a a project that was started before democracy. And then when democracy was established, people thought that this was too big to be a democratic temple because it was kind of star architecture of the time. And so construction was paused. And only until Hadrian came along and wanted to rebrand Athens, uh, he paid for it and, and had it built. And then again, immediately, it was pilfered for for marble, because back then. Um, so, I mean, it was, a, it was a kind of negative symbol. It was a symbol of tyranny. As you have now, like, oligarchs uh, working with architects, and somehow the museum is meant to be a positive symbol, but it ends up being a negative symbol. So it's also what, what you do with the museum, what you put in it, is not enough as a building to represent something. Why do, why do you like so much ruins? Because I'm Greek. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, actually, I, I, I've been, you know, it's, I'm in, into excavations and also self-archaeology through psych, psychoanalysis. So I actually realized when I, when I was a kid, uh, my mom was Norwegian. So every summer we had all these relatives from Norway visiting, multiple every summer. And of course, we would all have to take them to all the archaeological sites which was what Greece was offering, archaeological sites and beach. So I went to the Palace of Knossos like 10 times before I was five years old or something. I was expecting something deeper, but it's OK. No. But it's <laughs> something, you know. <laughs> uh, Tadeus, art has the the power to change things, to change the world, to practically, not just theoretically? Well, this, we, I think, in this room, we all believe in it, and, um, and we have to believe in it, and if we can really change structures and make a political movement, I don't know, maybe it's still in its own place, but... Um, as we know very well, I think, you know, we couldn't live without art, and art has changed all of our life and touches us deeply, but it also shows us, artists, you know, give us not only answers, but even asking the right question it already changes our life. Um, the impact on its maybe bigger level, um, I think we wish maybe that the impact would be bigger than, than it is, but um, out of my experience of these last 40 years, I have to say, it already changed tremendously. I think uh, when I speak to young people today, I have the feeling they live with art or they demand living with art and they demand living with contemporary art. I think when I grew up, I remember in Austria, you know, art kind of finished with Klimt and Kokoschka in Chile. And I think when you speak today with, with young people, they are interested, they know the artists of our time by name, they know more or less what they're doing, and demand knowing more about them. So I think it changed a lot, and, and I think we're going into the right direction, and um, 
the overall political impact, of course, we all wish it would be bigger. Uh, Sharon, uh, a museum, how can it participate into this change, changing of world, of, of uh, example, of... Of, of artists? Yeah. Of, of no, no the, the, the political or uh, social changes that uh, 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 could take place in society. A, a famous politician recently in Britain recently said that experts, nobody has any use for experts anymore. And I include in the kind of, kind of milieu of experts, artists, and people who take us to different places. Um, I believe that museums are places where experts should reside and expertise should reside. Um, and that is not about exclusive, exclusivity or elitism. It's about, um, it's about really uh, the talent of experts, curators, historians, archaeologists, scientists, who can show us, me, uh, help me to think about the world differently and help build my skills and capability as a critical thinker. Because, and that for me is why why museums are at the root of democracy, because we know, we've experienced people who do not want people to be critical thinkers. It works and serves some people, some politicians, some political forces very well that public do not think, very well because they can then impose a different view about history or the wrong view about history. So I think museums will continue and should continue to be places where expertise resides with critical thinking and is evidence-based. We can show the evidence of the world around us. So I think that's why museums are really at the heart of democracy. Tadeusz, I, I saw you uh, agreeing or disagreeing partly disagreeing because I thought this was a very provocative idea um, that experts should resign because of course we need experts, I believe still in this system of experts, just to keep the level up and to decide what is part of the canon and if we give this into a very big democratic discussion, uh, this is a huge experiment and I would know the outcome of this. Um, so it is a difficult balance to, to, to look for because on one hand, we need people with all the experience who are experts, because somehow somebody has to decide which artist will be part of the canon. And this discussion has to, be, um, has to happen on the highest possible, possible level. On the other hand, we, I think we should always more and more be diverse on, on the first one, and secondly also to have the voice of the public and the combination of the experts and the voice of the public who is not that educated or doesn't know because knowledge sometimes can also lead you in a wrong direction you know we can go wrong this is you know so many experts have failed in the past yeah but i like the idea because it's provocative you know to say you know let's just exchange the experts for i don't know who you would want to see there reside in museums and I, but I don't think expertise is only somebody who has gone through you know I've got a range of academic credentials I'm an expert in uh, not many things but one of the things I'm an expert in is cycling around London now I can give that expertise to somebody and that's worth something um, it's not a very wonderful, broad piece of expertise, but it might help somebody. Um, and so I, I don't think that, you know, I think expertise, you know, we, re we need to recognise other forms of expertise and to welcome that. And that is, for me, about how that's about democratising. Um, and yeah, I think me, I, I reside is, you know, the... the the, I don't see museums or art galleries like other important pieces of a social infrastructure. Let's say like a park. I would, I would see a museum and gallery as being more than a park. It's not just a place for, for any... Uh, this is going to sound wrong. Anything to happen. It's a place where um, 
there is a, 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 a corralling of thought and ideas and stuff. Andreas, do you agree with Tadeus or with Sharon? You, you won't escape. I mean, I'm confused because I thought, I thought Sharon said uh, experts should reside in museums, and I thought Tadeo said experts should resign from museums. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about this reside versus resign, or yes, of course, like institutions are, are curated objects, you know, and they tell a story, whereas a park. Uh, is, a, is a vessel for stories to happen, but it's like an open mic type of day. Whereas the institution uh, needs the structure because it, you know, the, the public needs guidance. So I don't know whose side, I'm, I'm, I'm with both of you, actually. <laughs> yes, well, we should have a vote, actually. We will propose a vote. Uh, I would, um, I would like to stay uh, a moment with you, Andreas. Uh, I know that the, the, the virtual reality is important in your work. Um, do you think that we have more chances to obtain democracy in the virtual world than in the real one? Um, yeah, I was a kind of pioneer for architecture online, and like on, in online platforms, but that, like way before it was trendy or NFT or anything like that. Um, I think, I don't know about virtual reality because it's every, every time that it manifests as a product in our society, like 10 years ago it was a second life, now it's the metaverse. It's like there's something missing there. Uh, for me it's like not convincing, even though I like that that was my environment but it's an environment for geeks or for experts of some type. But definitely the, the use of internet, like Twitter, is a major political tool and also uh, misused so much. Um, but it broadens the discussion. So yes, I think without internet, we would not be here. Yes, but all the voices, do you think they are equal? Yes, all voices are equal. That's the basis of democracy. Okay, Tadeus. <laughs> um, well, we couldn't fix democracy in the real world, you know. I think it's easy to say, let's try it in the metaverse. So I think we should still try to fix it in the real world, I would say. Sharon? I'm real world all the way. Um, uh, in that, I think we, we have play, there's a real need for reality. Uh, I, I, um, and are all voices equal? Of course they're all equal, but some are more interesting than others. Yes, and also I think the, the binary between virtual reality and reality doesn't really exist. Because, I mean, even when you're here, this is a reality of, an, of a conference, but then you might get a text message on your phone, and then that's a bit virtual. Uh, so everything, I mean, there's no binary anymore. We just have to negotiate to understand what, what it is that we're living through. But it's neither reality nor virtual reality, exactly. It's somewhere in between. Yes, but uh, in, uh, in digital reality, let's call it like that, I think that our, um, our behavior is different than in this physical reality. Uh, that's why I'm wondering if we're uh, this ideal of democracy or, or, or this ideal of, uh, equal, of, of being equal uh, is like a utopia that we're looking for. I mean, in, in real world, there are uh, social um, structures to respect. Whereas when you are an anonymous internet user, there's much less of that. So maybe, but I think it's, it's important to hear both, all the voices. Uh, of course, it becomes a problem when voices are manufactured, like in elections, and they kind of make, you know, I don't know, 200,000 um, Instagram accounts in Russia, 
for something. Like we, we're going through a lot of that right now, like of manufactured democracy, quote unquote. Um, so we, but I couldn't say that, oh no, what, what is important is what we're seeing here now. It's also important what you know, a nameless troll says, if it catches on and, and invites other people to that opinion. Uh, so it's a kind of tough time for democracy, actually. It has always been, maybe, I think. Yes, but now, like, recently, it's kind of escalating with, I don't know, Russia, Ukraine, Erdogan, you know, threatening or claiming a couple of Greek islands every week. Um, and he's like, where is this going? Uh, Tadeus, do you think that um, what's happening around us can really inspire artists to do important works of art, or it doesn't function this way? Um, I don't think it really functions that immediate. I think artists don't really comment so much what is going on right now at one specific place. I think artists hardly commented COVID in, you know, we haven't seen amazing artworks coming out of this crisis where everyone on this planet was somehow confronted with. Um, I don't expect really the conflict of um, uh, Russia and, and, and the Ukraine now um, being immediately, you know, we find it in, in some art production. I think artists are, and you said it before, it's much more utopian. It's much more to create a different world or to give us other thought-provoking ideas, and, but not so immediate, you know, not something which happens every day in politics. And I think the question of democracy is a much bigger and wider, and artists are able to give us um, views which we would not have and we would not be immediately confront with what we, what's happens every day. I think it's wider, it's much more tracing where we come from and where we might want to go or where we are going. Um, not necessarily to create an ideal world, but to create a different world. Sharon, uh, Tadeusz just said where we come from and where are we going. Uh, how do you, at, at the museum, can you combine the past the present and the future? That's a very active question. I mean, our, our museum, our collections go back 10,500 years to human population in the Thames that, um, uh, and into the future. And so we're always navigating this, um, the roots of humanity and the breadth of humanity as it's manifested in London um, through to, you know, what does it mean now? Uh, and absolutely into the future. And so it's quite amazing how human, the objects of humanity, and in our collection we have human skeletons as well, 20,000 Londoners. Um, you can use, you can, you can interrogate and investigate and reinterpret those objects, even the oldest object, through the lens of today and think about and imagine a future using an object. Um, and so it's a constant dialogue. Constant dialogue. We have six minutes and five seconds for a dialogue with you. So if you feel like asking a question or, a question. or two, but not more, Oh, sir, yes. This is a question for uh, Ms. Sharon Hammond. You posited that uh, a large public sector is uh, crucial in um, uh, for fostering a cap for capitalism to flourish. Um, that's interesting because Greece has a fairly massive public sector, and uh, through that, in order to feed itself, it Feel, still feels the need to slap a 5% uh, donation tax on top of the donation that is done to a public institution, uh, such as the, uh, former, the speaker before you. Um, how do you square that? Well, um, what I mean, well, I can't talk about tax regulation in, in Greece, forgive me, uh, but, and I can't talk about tax regulation in the UK for that matter either, because I don't know much about it, but I would, uh, what, what, I, um, what I'm 
were trying to get across was that we sometimes there is a there is there is a false belief, and, and I'm speaking as somebody who is more of a socialist than a pure capitalist, but I live in a capitalist world, um, and um, you know the the fallacy that ca uh, that that capitalism exists, can exist in a pure form without a social system to support it, was really exposed during the pandemic. When you saw how, you know, the need for public sector, across the world, public sector support for institutions, for businesses, for society was very necessary. And where governments had access to capital uh, and that, and it was their job to to, to support their societies, that enables capitalism to work. And so that's what I meant by that. And I think that is a really you know, important recognition that um, the social support, the support of society for artists, for, for uh, um, museums, for other sorts of cultural infrastructure, let alone health and what was education, it, it's just very evident, and that's something that should continue, in my mind. Another question? Yes, madam. Hello, thank you. Um, I just wanted to link this um, talk a little bit with the talks that we've had earlier on today. And of course here you're really trying to talk about art being democracy and art and it being available to everyone and also the sort of digital aspect of it. And somehow saying that um, the digital meta gives might create greater access, but actually we're living in a world of great digital divide and that divide is gender-based, is wealth-based, are we not really um, going to just repeat and e even make greater um, this sort of lack of access to art for all people through the digital process? And another question. Yes, madam. Yeah, so my question was for Sadeus, actually. You mentioned that um, you don't think that art is uh, produced as political events happen, and it's afterwards that you know the art is produced, and artists are not that influenced, but do you think photography maybe is an exception? Because I think from COVID, and even now in, in Ukraine, we've seen some amazing um, photographers documenting these events and some great art coming from that. Not really. I think photography always, you know, declares itself in different, uh, on different levels and different ways of expression. Um, it also describes a process or it also documents something. And I think we shouldn't mix up documentation of an event to creation of a new imagery or of uh, finding a new language. So I wouldn't really see photography in a, in a more direct comment to democracy, but documenting photography, of course, you know, this is highly important and this is partly used in, you know, great newspapers and any other media. But I think when we speak about, you know, photographer in, within the art world, I wouldn't see a difference, no. And one last question, tiny question with a tiny answer. 48 seconds. So I think that, no. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I think that we can now welcome uh, Farah Nayeri, who will talk with Kaos. Uh, and uh, thank, thank our guests for being so.